Joining me now is Dr. Anthony Fauci, Chief Medical Advisor to the President, as well as the Director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. Dr. Fauci, thank you so much for joining me today. I know we have a lot to cover. There's still a lot going on in this pandemic. Let's start with uh, the briefing uh, that you just held and talking about uh, the surge, uh, potential for a surge in the summer, specifically looking at the increase in cases right now. With the last year just in the rearview mirror and very freshly so, do you anticipate that we could see a repeat of a peak this summer? You know, that is certainly conceivable because when we had the peak that we had this past winter following the Christmas and New Year's holiday, then the the uh, cases came down precipitously, but unfortunately they plateaued before getting down to the very low level that we would have liked them to have gone to. And they plateaued at a level that was somewhat um, concerning because when you get to a level of 20, 30, 35, 40,000 cases per day, there is the danger that you will have a surge because we've seen that with previous surges where you plateaued at a high level. We've seen that in Europe, which is usually about three to four weeks ahead of us in the dynamics of the outbreak. They went up, came down, plateaued at a high level, pulled back on their public health mitigation methods, and then they began to get a surge, which is what we do not want to see. But if you look at the pattern over the last several days, we've gone up to the point where we are now at about 60 plus thousand new cases a day. That is a precarious situation to be in. One of the things in our favor is that we're having a very successful rollout of vaccines. We've now have over 50,000 people in the country are fully vaccinated. Over 100,000 have received at least one dose. And we're averaging between three and 4,000, excuse me, million, three, three and four million vaccinations per day. So the way I look at it, it really is kind of a race between the implementation of the vaccines and the danger or not of there being a bona fide surge where you speak up. We're seeing it doing this. Hopefully, the protection that's afforded to the community by the vaccinations will blunt any surge that is reminiscent of the previous surges that we've had, which were really quite steep in the incline of the surge. So the next few weeks are gonna be critical. I believe that the vaccine will actually have a major impact on preventing us from having a classical surge that we've seen before, but we can't be overconfident, which is one of the reasons why we keep saying over and over again, let's not declare victory prematurely by mm -hmm. pulling back on the public health measures of mask wearing, physical distancing, and avoiding congregate settings. It is too premature to do that. We need to hang on a bit longer. We all understand that we're all feeling COVID-19 fatigue and we wanna cut loose and get back to some degree of normality. And that will come for absolutely certain that will come, but we don't wanna jump the gun on it and precipitate another surge. And I know that you've talked many times about the idea that we have to have a majority of Americans of all ages vaccinated in order to be able to remove masks and the big question of when do we reach that herd immunity. But, but factored into that as well, I know, um, is the idea of what happens when we do in fact reopen, when we do get to the point that we can start moving around comfortably. I know the idea of vaccine passports has been brought up multiple times. So in the previous administration, we saw that there was definitely a clear rule of not overreaching and, and respecting that uh, side of the argument. But we did start seeing a mask mandate at the start of the year, at least in federal uh, buildings and, and places. So where do you see sort of the role and, and why can't the government take a role of sort of a middle ground and advisor like yourself take on the role of saying, well, you know, these certain entities should require vaccine passport, large theaters, say, for example, um, but not, uh, but leave the rest of it up to smaller businesses? Well, I mean, there is and has been 
for quite a while a reluctance on the part of the federal government to mandate down things that might be perceived by some people as being unfair and discriminatory, if not coercive. Now, at the local level, as you've alluded to, it is quite conceivable that there will be organizations. It could be universities. It could be places of employment. It could be any of a number of entities that would require proof of vaccination before a person can either enter or participate in a certain location or a certain function. But there is clearly a reluctance on the part of the federal government, and I don't believe that's going to change, that they do not want to dictate at the federal level things that locally could be perceived as being discriminatory or potentially punitive. On that note, we know that right now there are increasing guidance for traveling, both on cruises and on flights, opening it up for those who have been fully vaccinated. But what we see globally is still a scenario of not enough vaccinations and countries still closing their borders to the U.S. Uh, do you anticipate that maybe other countries will follow suit on this rule of fully vaccinated individuals being allowed to move more freely? Well, I think that certainly is going to be a pattern you're going to see globally. I mean, the more people that get vaccinated and the more the, the greater the proportion of vaccinated people in society, you're going to see the level of infections go way down. That's just going to be a natural consequence of getting a lot of people vaccinated. We're going to see that in the United States. We're doing very well. As I mentioned, each day that goes by, you have another three to four million people vaccinated. There will come a time reasonably soon when the proportion of vaccinated people together with the proportion of those who've already been infected and likely will be protected against reinfection, that you're going to see a greater diminution in the number of cases and a greater freedom and flexibility in what people can do. And as you've as you know, you've seen from the CDC gradually they're coming out with recommendations and guidelines of what vaccinated people can do. The first they did was talk about what one can do in the setting of the home when you're with other vaccinated people and even unvaccinated people that you could pull back on some of the guidelines, not necessarily wear a mask, have physical contact. Recently, they came out saying that people who are vaccinated when you fly you do not need to be tested when you go or return from a destination unless it is dictated by the destination that you're going to. You don't have to quarantine when you come back from another country. So gradually you're going to see a rolling out of flexibility of things that vaccinated people can do. Speaking of those other countries, we still know that, uh, you know, the global situation for vaccines is, is pretty dire still. We are in the situation in this country where we do have more doses that will likely be available uh, well after we have enough for the entire population. The situation with the emergent plant and Johnson & Johnson is just an example of that, that that's not going to disrupt uh, the doses yet that, that we're going to see in this country. But with AstraZeneca and Novavax also still in phase three trials, what is going to happen to these doses once those authorizations come through and once these additional doses are produced? Well, you said correctly that we have contracted for more doses than you'd need to vaccinate everybody in this country, and as well as having some that we could use for boosting if we need to boost. The United States is sensitive to the needs of other countries. We have re-entered and rejoined the WHO. We have joined COVAX, which is a consortium of countries and organizations dedicated to equity in the distribution of vaccines globally. We've pledged $4 billion for that. We've given and will give vaccines to Canada and to Mexico. And when we get our people vaccinated and we have enough that we have for boosting, that we are certainly open and quite flexible in sharing and giving some of the surplus that we have to countries who need it.
So wait until then. Okay. And what about the the virus right now? There's so much coming out about uh, how well the vaccines protect, and and we're learning a little bit more and continue to learn more about how it's affecting different individuals. But we do not yet know some of the key questions, like uh, you know what uh, whether or not vaccinated individuals can be asymptomatic travelers. What are some other things that you're still waiting to learn about this virus? Well, I think the one that you mentioned is critical because it'll really tell you a lot more about what vaccinated people can do. Theoretically, since the primary endpoints of the vaccine trials were whether the vaccine prevented clinically apparent illness, clinically recognizable illness, it did not specifically address whether it could protect against asymptomatic infection. That being the case, it is conceivable and theoretically possible and perhaps in reality uh, possible, certainly, that an individual could be infected while vaccinated, not know it because they don't have any symptoms, and inadvertently spread the infection to someone else, which is the reason why that the CDC still recommends wearing masks after you get vaccinated. However, having said that, as more and more data become available, and as we get information from the long-range follow-up from our clinical trials, it's becoming more and more apparent that vaccinated people have a much lower incidence of getting infected in an asymptomatic way than people who are not vaccinated. And even as important or more important, the level of virus in their nasopharynx, if they do develop a breakthrough infection, is considerably lower than the nasopharynx viral load in people who are not vaccinated but got infected in an asymptomatic way. The ultimate proof of whether a vaccinated person will transmit virus to another, even if they're without symptoms, will come from a study that's already started on college campuses in which individuals will be vaccinated and they will be closely followed with nasal swabs to detect the virus, but also 25,000 of their close contacts will be followed to see if they actually transmitted an asymptomatic infection to someone else. So we're going to get the definitive answer to your question. And when we do, if it turns out that vaccinated people just don't spread the infection to other people when they have an asymptomatic infection, then you're going to see guidelines that will pull back on some of the stringency of wearing masks and other public health measures. There also have been advocates of uh, testing it and increased rapid testing. We know that the FDA has authorized several tests, but many of them are yet unavailable to pretty much the whole country. Uh, they're either available in pockets of the country or not at all yet. Uh, are we going to be able to move forward? And has that been one of the hurdles uh, to removing the mask mandate? Well, you know, a, a testing for surveillance by antigen testing really has another major purpose, and that is to get a feel for the penetrance of infection in society that you don't notice because there are people who are without symptoms. We can do it screening in schools in factories, in places where you want to know whether or not you're having a degree of penetrance. That's the major reason for having a greater degree of surveillance testing by antigen testing, particularly of asymptomatic individuals. Dr. Anthony Fauci, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you. It's good to be with you. Thank you for having me.